Good morning, all. Uh, I think I've met a number of you, but for those of you who haven't met, uh, my name is Mr. Prince, and I am the Dean of Multicultural uh, Education uh, here at Taft, and uh, I am one of the school's lead diversity, equity, and inclusivity practitioners. Um, and it's my job, or uh, my job to lead some of our efforts uh, to ensure that we have a diverse uh, community, uh, that all members of our community have what they need to be successful here at Taft, uh, and that everybody feels included, welcomed, wanted, and at home here on campus. Now I say I'm one of the folks who works on this because the reality is that this work has to be done by all of us. It will not be successful if it's just me in my office, right? All of you are charged with doing this work. And that's what I'm here to talk about today, is what it looks like when we work to make Taft more diverse, more equitable, and more inclusive. Okay. So I'm going to start by uh, showing you all our DEI statement, which uh, a number of folks got together and wrote a couple years ago. Uh, I think most of you, if not all of you, have at least seen this document. Uh, I know that monitors and lower mids did some work with the document earlier this year. Uh, it's posted in classrooms, it's posted in the hallways, it's posted in the dorms. Uh, but as Mr. Wilson is fond of saying, some of the best learning we do is recursive learning, right? We have to see things over and over and over again. So I'm going to post the document, I'm going to give you a minute to read it, uh, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. Unless my projector, unless this is frozen. Sorry, technical difficulty, give me a moment. So this is one of those worst nightmare things as a teacher. You get to class, you're ready to go, and all of a sudden the technology isn't working. Oh my goodness. There we are. Hey, round of applause. All right, the tech is back. Uh, so, you know, this is a statement. That, that statement um, it, it is meant to be a statement of, one, who we are and the work that we do, but also who we strive to be. Uh, and it's powerful, and it's really well written. And I'd like to take a moment uh, just to highlight the folks on the committee uh, who helped to craft that statement a couple years ago at this point. Now. I work with that statement frequently. I cite it uh, when I write emails to you all. I'm sure you're familiar with that. I cite it when I speak with folks both inside and outside of the community. And, and I've got to admit, when I look at it sometimes, it can be daunting. <laughs> I say, is it possible that I am doing all of those things in my work here at Taft? Uh, and I imagine if I'm thinking that, you all might think the same thing. Can we live up to the principles embodied in that statement? And the answer is yes, you know it. <laughs> and that's what I'm here uh, to say today, is that we do this on a daily basis, probably without knowing it. Uh, and I'm gonna share some examples with you of the work that we do in this way. And more importantly, if Queen Bee says it, you know it's true. Uh, so first I'm gonna start with some of the systematic things that our school leaders do. Uh, a couple years ago, uh, the folks from the Red Rhino Fund, uh, sorry, which is a, uh, an endowed charitable board that's charged with uh, helping to create positive change in Waterbury, uh, they undertook some self-reflection uh, and recognized that they were a relatively homogenous group 
in some ways. They talked about this fact amongst themselves, they met with their advisors, they met with me, and they decided to take up some systematic changes uh, to their application process with the hope of changing this. They reevaluated how they assessed candidates. If the only thing or the primary thing that they valued was experience with charitable, charitable boards, they were probably going to get a pretty particular subset of the community to apply. They thought about how they got the word out about the Red Rhino Fund. Uh, in particular, they were purposeful about going to affinity groups and talking to those groups about the Red Rhino Fund. And they thought seriously about implicit bias, what kind of biases they were bringing to the application process and how to combat those. And the result of all of this work was a broader, more diverse pool of applicants and consequently a more diverse board. This is a great example of the work that we can do as a school to embody the principles in that statement. Our upper mid-class committee, they're preparing for Hotchkiss Day and they've been dealing with a question about the inclusivity of shirt designs. Right? They came up with a design that prominently featured the American flag and it was an awesome design, it was really cool. But part of what they struggled with was whether or not all folks would feel included, connected to that shirt. Right? There's nothing wrong with an American flag on a shirt, but given the broad range of folks we have on campus, and in particular, the fact that we have people from th some 39 different countries, would they feel connected to that shirt? They met with school leaders, they met with myself, uh, and I think that they decided to go with a different design with the hopes that more people would feel connected and want to take part in uh, the Hotchkiss Day festivities. And then we've got the work of our head monitors, some of the presentations that they've done early this year. Um, Dickie, on our opening day, our move-in day, uh, I thought did a great job of talking about the power of a welcoming presence, a purposeful uh, welcoming of new students into the community that he experienced when L.J. Foley made a, made a point of reaching out to him and his efforts to pay that forward. And then Ma Maggie's uh, morning meeting talk. Uh, I thought was just so powerful and so pointed all the way through, but I'm gonna share with you a minute of that talk uh, that I thought was uh, particularly important insofar as the diversity, equity, and inclusivity work uh, that we take up. Taft is an amazing place. We are all unbelievably lucky to have been given this opportunity. So, what I challenge us to do in making these claims about this place being special and us along with it, is to make a Taft where school meetings don't happen because a member of our community has been mistreated or disrespected, but because we are excited to give everyone a voice. A Taft where dining halls are left clean because we all know that every man and woman that works at Taft deserves the respect and the time it takes to simply clean off a table. A Taft where we ask the names of the women and men that keep our dorms, our classrooms, the dining halls, and Bingham clean a Taft where freshman girls aren't told to know their place and where boys can talk about girls behind closed doors without feeling they have to sacrifice their integrity and kindness. A Taft where guys and girls have honest and loving friendships and it's not sketch. We are all part of a larger collective of people. Let's take that responsibility and act accordingly. Yeah. Yes, that, that is such a powerful call from one of our preeminent student leaders right, to continue to make Taft a special place and on top of that, the particular folks uh, that she referenced, uh, I, I thought that was just uh, so wonderful. Right. So these are the broad, systematic ways that we can go about embodying these principles. But it also happens on, a daily, on the daily basis and, and uh, in our commonplace interactions with each other. And I think that's really important to highlight as well. It happened when uh, Mashad Harrison, uh, we were out of football practice uh, and some music uh, came on uh, the speaker. Uh, and while it was clean, some of the messages were not overly inclusive uh, of those, uh, all the folks who might be hearing it. So Mashad unprompted went over and changed the music. It happened at sit-down dinner when Mina Zhao shared with us the difference between jasmine rice and white rice and how important that is, and the table leaned in and listened. 
It happened when Willard Anderson engaged in a real conversation about prison reform and APUSGov. Now, what do I mean by a real conversation? He stated his opinion, he stated his point, and then he listened as others made points that were different from his. Now, that's not to say that he changed his mind. He doesn't have to. But the simple fact of listening to understand rather than listening to respond, that is us doing this work. It happens with the work that the monitors do at the beginning of the year and thereafter to ensure that the dorms are equitable and inclusive where folks feel welcomed and wanted it at home. And a special shout out to my Centen uh, dorm mod team for taking up this conversation uh, last night and for all the work that they've got coming up. And it happens with the student leaders of the GSA convene meetings every Friday night without fail to support LGBTQ students and their allies. Unless you think that this is just students doing this work, faculty and staff are at it as well. Ms. Silverman initiated a conversation about folks wearing traditional clothing, traditional formal clothing, to uh, sit down dinner. And Blessing wore one of his Ankars as an example. Right? Mr. Antonucci created the time and space for faculty in the history department to look at and examine our primary sources to try to make them more diverse. Mr. Bernier, Mr. Tellis, Ms. Herr, Ms. Burkell, Ms. Garcia, Ms. Duffy, and Ms. Danaher giving of their time to facilitate affinity groups. Mr. Katkovich took time this summer to go to the National Diversity Practitioners Institute to improve the work that he does both in his job as a counselor but also in the school more generally. And Mr. Mack says over and over and over again to the adults in this community that these are the messages that we have to convey to everyone. These examples are it. This is us doing the work. It's us embodying the principles in that statement. The Red Rhino Fund, embracing the intentionality of our diverse community and trying to have that represented on their board. The Upper Mid Committee, preparing themselves both morally and pragmatically for global citizenship. Monitors, committing to work in the dorms as acknowledging and respecting and empathizing with folks of different identifiers. Conversations uh, about prison reform as willingly challenging our own beliefs. And students and adults uh, committing to do work at conferences as taking up co-curricular opportunities to participate in ongoing work. This is the work that we do, and I don't know if you all recognize that, but you are taking these steps every day. And I want you to, I want to pause, give yourselves a round of applause because you are doing awesome stuff. And this work is also going to take the form uh, of some painful moments, and we will survive them and thrive through them. I often say to my, uh, my Gov class, uh, do you learn that the stove is hot from somebody telling you that it's hot or from touching it? Probably best from touching it. Uh, and that's true uh, of, of just about all learning. We learn when we make mistakes. Right? And that's some of the more important learning we do. That's some of the learning that sticks the best. Now, is it particularly fun to touch that hot stove? No. Right? It's painful, uh, and it's awkward, and it's uncomfortable, and we have to lean into it. Right? Because if we do, if we take the right approach, if we apologize for the mistakes we make, and we uh, commit to doing better, we will learn and grow and survive through that. So I've got just a couple of examples uh, from my life. I mean, this work is literally my job. <laughs> it's the bulk of what I do on a daily basis. And if we spent time talking about every single mistake I've made and every single lesson I've learned just in the past two years, we'd probably be here through Saturday. Uh, and I know nobody wants that. So I'll give just two examples. Uh, last year, uh, Ms. Garcia uh, and a student were having a uh, rather uh, intense conversation. Uh, and I decided to mansplain my way into that conversation. Now, my voice wasn't needed in that dialogue. I don't think it was particularly wanted in that dialogue. And yet, uh, I thought it was appropriate to step in. Uh, immediately after that, I felt pretty terrible about it. I went home, I thought about it, and I texted Ms. Garcia and I apologized because uh, I had uh, just had a moment where my male privilege got in the way of what I know to be best. And she accepted my apology. I've done better since. We have a good working relationship, and I consider myself really lucky uh, to call her a friend. Okay. Another example. Um, 
we had our first Asian and Asian American uh, student affinity group meeting last year, and I compiled an email list to be sent out to students, and I uh, accidentally omitted uh, some students from that email list. Now imagine how painful that was to have this first group meeting and to not be invited. Right? Now I know what my intentions were. I certainly didn't mean to uh, hurt anyone, and yet the impact was real. Uh, and thankfully a number of students reached out, including Kunchuk, uh, and the result was that we found a systematic approach uh, to addressing this error. Right? All students are invited now, and Kunchuk and I are still okay. We collaborate together. We are fine. So in summary, uh, not only do we do this work, but we do it all the time in ways that are both familiar and habitual, right? Uh, we do it in system, at the systematic level that impacts the way that the school functions, uh, and we do it in the commonplace interactions that are so important to our, uh, our, our regular day-to-day. -day. We do it when it's fun and easy, and we have to lean into it when it's really difficult and challenging. And guess what? Those difficult, challenging moments will be okay. And we have to do it more. We can always do it more. And that's part of the reason I'm here today is to suggest to you that this is what it looks like and I hope you will take it up uh, in the future. So, uh, looking forward. Uh, tomorrow, uh, we will gather in groups uh, during the Alt Wednesday meeting block uh, to talk about what it looks like when you all do this work in your day-to-day -day experience, okay? Uh, I, later today, I will send out an email uh, with your room assignments. Uh, you all will be grouped by your English classes. Uh, what do you need to do? You need to be at your assigned room at 9.55 with a writing implement. Uh, I thank you uh, for your attention today. I thank you for bearing with me through the technical difficulties. And I thank you for all the work that you're going to do tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs>